your friends Up in the hills where the party never ends Your schemes and your dreams when you're whole and you're broken I'm telling all about it in my words unspoken Welcome to Words Unspoken, the Hills podcast Paying tribute to the reality show that aired on MTV from 2006 to 2010. We are two Southern sisters re-watching The Hills in 2016 and chatting about it weekly for your entertainment. My name is Susan, and I'm a 30-something photographer who hates most reality shows but loves The Hills. I have been re-watching the show for a few months. My name is Jem. I'm a professional in my 30s who hasn't seen the show since it originally aired, so I'm really looking forward to reliving the magic again 10 years later. We watched the first few seasons of the show in real time when we were younger versions of ourselves, and we are so excited to revisit every episode from our new points of view. We're back, y'all! We're back, y'all! Hey! We're so excited to be back. We're sorry that we haven't seen you in about three months. It has been one of those busy times of year as a photographer. You know, like accountants are super busy in April. Well, photographers are really busy in September, October, and November. So I sincerely apologize, but we are so excited to be back. Susan, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy pre-holiday photography schedule to hang out with us. We definitely missed all of our friends and fans, and we appreciate y'all staying in such close touch with us on social media over the past few months. And really, honestly, the real reason why Jem and Susan of Words Unspoken Hills podcast have taken this three-month hiatus is, if you recall, we completed our last episode with the nail-biting cliffhanger of, is Heidi pregnant? Or is she not? And we wanted y'all to be in suspense all this time, (laughs) waiting to find out if Heidi is pregnant in 2007. And we're about to find out the truth in three, two, one. Today, we will be discussing The Hills episode two of season two, When You Least Expect It. So this episode, we start out at the Hillside Villas. And it's a direct pickup from the last episode. So basically, Heidi tries to come out and tell Lauren that she just took a pregnancy test. And Lauren is clearly trying to make her work to say it because she keeps talking about other things. And then finally, Heidi gets a a word in edgewise and says, I just took a pregnancy test. I love the look of just utter shock on Lauren's face. She's just thinking, oh, this is the worst thing ever. I'm horrified. Heidi says, we were careful and everything, but I don't know, Heidi. Heidi. What do you mean you were careful and everything? If you were careful. There's no and everything. There's no and everything. So you weren't careful enough. I think she was very careful. And you know how I feel about the situation, Susan. I don't even have to say it. Heidi loves the drama, Jim. Okay. So, you know, when she says something about like, oh, going through something like this makes you want to talk to them. And she keeps, you know, trying to have that conversation. And Lauren just gives her like a withering look and says, I'll talk to you and I won't cheat on you. So funny. Susan, you know, I think this is a really crucial point in the history of the Hills. We've had a couple of these other moments, or maybe when it comes to Heidi and Lauren's relationship as friends, this moment when Lauren is like, you could have just talked to me and kind of just dismissing the concept of boys. And then Heidi says something obsessive about how, you know, what should I say to them? What should I do? And just do they care? And all this kind of stuff. When Lauren's like, uh, I'm your friend and I'm right here. I was just downstairs. You could have asked me. Heidi just doesn't want to have that conversation because she's so busy obsessing about boys. This is a direct rejection of their friendship, showing that Heidi is always going to put boys first. Her girlfriends are never going to be on an equal, remotely equal playing field with these boys. And Spencer's a new random boy at this point, too. Okay, I have a question for you, Jim. The whole thing Heidi is saying is she's asking Lauren, okay, I'm not pregnant, but should I tell Spencer or not? And I would love to know your opinion on if you think when something like this happens that someone should tell this guy that she's been dating maybe a month or two that she thought she was pregnant, but she's not. Like, what do you think about that? Okay, well, let's rewind. So she is basically fighting with another girl girl over Spencer. Yes. She wants to win the fight. She has her heart set on winning Spencer and for Audrina to lose. What can Heidi do to to differentiate herself from the competition? Why she can magically suddenly get nauseous and confused at work for a few days, even though they were really careful. So I don't think that I am 
being a conspiracy theorist by confidently stating that this entire situation was trumped up by Heidi and there was never any nausea or confusion outside of her nausea. I'm sorry. I just got nausea because you said trumped up. <laughs> I continue. No pun intended. No pun intended. So the, all the nausea and confusion was over her not being Spencer's only leading lady. She can't stand to share her beloved Spencer with anyone else, especially Audrina. So she has to raise the stakes. Therefore, we get the bogus pregnancy test, the bogus drama surrounding it. It is all too clear to me what happened. And boys are more important than anything else in the world to Heidi. And that particular boy may still be the most important to this day. Hello. There's no need to tell him anything about it, is my point. I mean, okay. In real life. Yeah, and I think that we should finish that discussion when we get to the next scene. Okay. So that we can talk about, like, final thoughts. So then we head to Bull House, and Heidi calls Spencer and dramatically asks to meet her in the back alley. Spencer seems a little worried, so I can only guess that he's worried she's found out about his latest girl. Oh, 100%. He, that's what he thinks this is going to be about. And so he's going to be so relieved when she says what it actually is. Susan, I've been waiting a long time to do this, and I'm devastated that there's no Brent Bolt House at Bolt House. Very but sad. Heidi really did channel him when she said, meet me in the box. <laughs> so then we head to Teen Vogue, and we go to Lisa's office, and of course she's on the phone like she always is when the girls are coming to her office. Very important call. She tells Lauren and Whitney that they're going to go work the Ashley Page fashion show because she's friends with Amy Astley, so they have to do like a really good job. And Whitney f- kind of freaks out, and she's like, oh, I have school tomorrow. And Lisa's like, well, school is the most important thing, but when can you get there? And all I can think is, oh, my gosh, that seems really stressful. Yeah, Lisa was basically saying, I don't care about your school. Tell me how early you can get to this fashion show. And did you notice Lisa Love was rocking a new hairdo, Susan? I did. Yeah, higher the hair, the closer to God, Lisa Love. So Lauren is going to be on her own in this fashion show representing Teen Vogue. Dun, dun, dun. And I love when Lisa says, Lauren, can you do this on your own? And Lauren looks like she's about to get arrested and thrown in prison for life and says, mm-hmm. She always looks terrified when she's in Lisa's office anyway. Yeah, she always looks scared. But this is, like, next level where her eyes are, like, falling out of her head with horror. And she's like, "Mm mm-hmm. And it basically is the same thing as her being like, no way. (laughs) No help. So then we head back to Bull House, and Heidi is waiting in the alley. Jim, I would like to start a new count this season. Uh How many times will Heidi and Spencer talk outside of Bolt House? Wait, is this going to be a recurring theme? Absolutely. Number one. I'm going to have to go on another hiatus. (laughs) Spencer greets Heidi with, well, hello, dear, in the most condescending tone. Uh Are you an 80-year-old man, Spencer? Susan? If I believed that this was a truly open and honest and organic tale that was unfolding, this would be the lowest of the low thing to do. Using a fake pregnancy to get a boy all to yourself. No, 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 no. Not that. She is using a fake pregnancy to see how Spencer really feels about her. She is testing him. They're basically playing mind games with each other and with us all the time, and I feel used already. This early in the game. Instead of being like, I thought I was pregnant, but I'm not. She drags it way out. Like, she goes that extra mile that's not acceptable. And And making him think. I do think it's funny when he starts gulping water and he looks very nervous. (laughs) That's pretty funny. I did enjoy that a little. But still, that's so wrong of her. Like, that is not cool at all. Existential question for you, Susan. Yes, Jim. Should we in any way, shape, or form admire Heidi and Spencer for everything that they're doing to us and doing to the producers and each other should we have any kind of admiration for any of this or should we always condemn it because i think we're gonna have to decide going forward how we're gonna treat this it depends you mean should we admire them for their fame whoring capabilities (laughs) i was thinking more from like a manipulation perspective same thing it's pretty impressive actually and they're still doing it to this day oh absolutely and they admit it too it's not like they're trying to hide i mean they wrote a book on how to manipulate audiences for money and stuff. So, <laughs> Did um, they really? I personally, yes. I personally would not 
do not admire them for this. But, I mean, it worked for them. They were making a lot of money in those years. At what price, though, Susan? At what price? The price of your soul. (laughs) Basically, she's tricking him. She's trying to trick him into confessing how he really feels. But at this point, like, that is a terrible time to trick a guy into something. Because any guy is probably going to freak out when you're, what, 21 years old. And you've been dating this girl for two months. Well, that comes up in the act next scene, actually. And Spencer tells her, I'm more than like you, way more. What are we going to do? And he says, whatever you want to do. And um, I have to say, like, his response was great. Like, it's your yeah. body. You do what you want, and I support you in any way. That is the perfect response. It really is. Shockingly, he gave, like, the perfect response. So the end of this scene is my favorite after all of the mind games and the weirdness in the car. When he says, I'm a little bit irritated. I'm a little bit irritated that you just had me thinking you were pregnant for a second there. That's a terrible Spencer. The more you, the more you grin without smiling, the more like Spencer you will sound. Okay. As, as an expert and doing a wide variety of voices, I can tell you that you sound more and more like Spencer the more you grin. (laughs) It's a humorless grin. It's kind of like a grin, like, I'm going to kill you, but you're smiling. If you could see me, I'm doing it right now. Yeah, Susan's Susan's baring her teeth. Jim, I have an announcement to make. Go on. For the first and possibly the last time, I am on Spencer Pratt's side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not hard to take his side in this part of the episode, but that won't last long. And then Spencer says, Audrina's out of her mind. And I go back to hating him. Yeah. It only lasted for a fleeting second. He's so manipulative. Relationships aren't about test children. Well, apparently it worked out okay for them. (laughs) It's kind of strange that it did. But anyway. Stranger things have happened in Hollywood. Susan, at the end of the scene, when Heidi leaves Spencer in the car and walks away, she's doing her cute put that in quotations, butt wiggle. She's like, LOL, just pretended I'm pregnant with your kid. Look how adorable I am as I totter away. On the field. <laughs> L- this is so fun. Ha ha ha. I love a fake pregnancy scare to uh, win my man. So then we go back to the hillside villas and Heidi goes in and tells Lauren the whole story. And Lauren's reaction is pretty much the same as my reaction. She's rolling her eyes. She's just so like, really, this is the dumbest thing ever. I can't believe you did this. But Literally her Her eyes roll back so far. I think she's just going to, like, fall over backwards. They really do. You can tell she's just thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed for you that you did this on national TV. Classic Heidi. You look like a fool. But she very diplomatically says, I don't think that there is a right way to react to that, though. Right. Like, for example, a guy like Spencer, when truly confronted with this terrifying potential news, would never have reacted as gracefully as he did. But again. And he probably would not have gone out with her again. (laughs) Yeah, he never would have been seen again. He and Audrina would have been in love and lived happily ever after. But hey. But that would have prevented us from ever meeting you-know-who. And suddenly... Justin Bobby's Spoiler alert! (laughs) And suddenly Heidi starts talking about how Lauren needs to go on a date with Spencer's friend Brody Jenner. So let's change the subject from my manipulative pregnancy scare to, oh, you need to go on a cute date, a date with a cute boy. Exactly. We have to get it all in at one time. The camera crew can't be there every day. And I loved Lauren's reaction. She's like, oh, he has been touched by Kristen and he is tainted because Brody Jenner dated Kristen Cavallari, who was on Laguna Beach and was always Lauren's rival. So was Brody on Laguna Beach at all? Brody was not on Laguna Beach because it was after Kristen was on Laguna Beach. I guess it was when she was in college or I don't know when it was. Okay, It was so... probably during season one of The Hills. And he also dated Nicole Richie. What? But anyway, I, Brody's dated a lot of people. We can talk about that later. Anyway, Heidi says he has a crush on Lauren. But as we know from the Us Weekly <laughs> the anniversary special, Brody and Spencer were desperate to get on the hills because they had just had a failed reality show called The Princess of Malibu and that had been canceled. So they wanted to get on a reality show. 
So this is all like master manipulation. So if anyone ever thought like any of this was real, I know we don't talk about it being real, but just remember none of it is real. And we'll talk about that more next week. I thought it was so real and I'm reliving when I was watching in real time. Did you really think it was real when you watched it the first time? I think I was so busy falling in love with Brody and his cuteness that I didn't see right through into his very soul. (laughs) How could I have been fooled by him? at such a young age I'm I was actually over this this episode as well as the next which I watched together I was legit let down because nothing was the same I expected to fall in love with Brody exactly like I did the first time around and nothing was the same because now I know the truth I've been cheated and lied to by Brody Jenner and I know you're I still half, love you, Brody. I still love you. I know you're half joking, but that really was the reaction yeah. after the 10th anniversary special was people yeah. were seriously upset about it. And of course, you know, I never knew it was fake to that level of fakeness. But let's talk more about that in the next episode. Brody just always seemed like the good guy in the show, especially after she's like, you know, done with Jason and like other guys that come along and Spencer and all this. Brody just always to me was like the normal nice person. And now rewatching him wooing Lauren is like it makes me ill speaking of being nauseated and confused like Heidi (laughs) that's how this all made me feel (laughs) well I don't think I felt like that as much as and you know I don't want to get into too much what is coming down the road but I always think with Brody at least he always tries to talk like in a reasonable manner and he talks to her as a friend so he's not as bad as like Spencer but yes I I see what you're saying you can definitely see the manipulations more yeah he's spitting so much game it's like it's a little much anyway so Lauren's like I'll take a rain check on that he's like already gave him your number lol Uh uh-huh it's so funny when I do things without asking you and Lauren is super annoyed which I don't blame her obviously this is the second season of the hills she's definitely a celebrity right Like, Heidi should not be giving her number to anyone. That's completely inappropriate. I feel like it's more inappropriate than if they were just two normal girls. Like, that's not cool at all. She can date whoever she wants. She doesn't need Heidi to give her, like, a pity date and a pity phone number hookup. Lauren can take care of her own business. I'm not sure she can, to be honest. <laughs> uh, she Her dating history in this show is really bad, and I would like to discuss yeah. that more towards the end of her arc, because yeah. I think it would be interesting to talk about why that is. But anyway, so we go to the Ashley Page store, where they're getting ready for the fashion show. As soon as Lauren shows up, Ashley immediately yells at her, do you know how to answer phones? Can we talk about how Ashley Page stayed up the whole night the night before not finishing her collection for the fashion show, but writing down hilarious, rude lines to yell at the reality TV celebrity who was going to be in her office for a few minutes that day? I feel the same way about her as I did about Kelly Catrone acting (laughs) out and trying to be (laughs) so, like, badass in front of the MTV cameras. I mean, she says, interns never know how to answer phones. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry, who doesn't know how to answer a phone? That is the dumbest thing ever. Like, to mention, Lauren never said, like, what should I say? What should I do? This woman's just barking instructions at her like she's an idiot. And this woman knows that she knows how to answer her phone. She knows who Lauren is. She probably was so excited to have her involved in this project and was like, what are the 10 awful, memorable things I can say to this girl? And all I can think is how that must be for Lauren. That must be so frustrating. Right. Every time she's, whether she's at these parties or these fashion shows, because technically her level of fame at this time was enough for her to be like in the front row of all these fashion shows but all of a sudden she's having to work them and being treated like this and I'm not one to say like people shouldn't work hard and pay their dues I believe in all that stuff but I just hate when they do this kind of thing and they're only doing it for like sound bites and probably to try to get their own shows which obviously worked for Kelly it's just right. so irritating to me. I just, I can't imagine being in a position where someone's always trying to trip you up like that yeah. on a next level. It's like they're trying to take advantage or something and make her look bad. It's like, I always feel like in all these work scenes, people are almost rooting for her to fail. Oh, yeah. It's just irritating to me instead of trying to be encouraging. I would obviously do not belong in the fashion world. That's for sure. Think about think about all of the people who were watching the show who didn't know these people personally, who were rooting for Lauren to mess up every step of the way, and they were like, "Oh, Team Spencer, or whatever." You know, not everybody loves Lauren like we do. We're very biased. That's why I don't like reality shows these days because it's all about 
people failing and ripping hair out and all the, how can you have a wild fight? And I just like to root for like a good guy. So I don't know. Not that I always have to have that in anything I consume. I love books that are about unlikable people, but these reality shows these days do not appeal to me at all. I actually only watch scripted TV shows about bad people, as you know, Susan. Yes. Favorite shows are like Californication and Weeds. House of Lies. House of Lies. Like all these awful people. There's no good people to root for. Shameless is my latest show that fits into that category about awful people. But luckily we have our good guy, Susan. And we're back in 2007 in a little bit more innocent time. And there is a lot of talk surrounding this magic candle that came from the store across the street. From the, the witch Ashley store. The, yeah, the witch store. It's not open yet. They're like a witch store. <laughs> this magic candle really works. So if Lauren can find the wick and light it, Ashley will make a ton of money. If Lauren can't find the wick and it doesn't get lit, then Ashley's fashion show will be a huge disaster. So really, the fate of Ashley Page is resting on Lauren finding this wick. Or apparently that's what one would get from the panic that is ensued about this stupid candle. And it's a money candle and they really need money right now, Susan. Fake it till you make it. Pretend you have the money, Ashley. Don't say you don't have money. Come on. Come on, Ashley. You know better than that. Ashley tells Lauren, uh, why don't you wear a watch? And Lauren's like, gives this laugh, like, is this one for real? Because, hello, this is 2007, and people look at their phones, they don't have watches. And I love how the woman has to ask, how do you know what time it is? And she's like, I always have my phone with me. End of argument. Lauren wins. Oh, Ashley, you're so old. And then Ashley says, us ugly people gotta bust our asses, and talks about models being pretty and not doing anything. Like, that's just rude. It was so (laughs) rude. I hated that line. I'm like, are you shaming the model? It's not their fault. They're gorgeous. Everybody has a job in this industry. And being a fashion designer, the models are part of what you do. And y'all should respect each other. And I just felt like that was a really inappropriate thing for a designer to say on the eve of her show. And then, miracle of all miracles, Lauren finds the wig. And all of a sudden, she's the new hero. Everyone's lauding her to the skies. I love how the, I don't know who he is, maybe another intern or something. He's like, Ashley, 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 freaking out. She found she found it. Everyone's freaking out. It's and Ashley says, "You can stay." Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad I can stay to produce your fashion show with your super ugly fashions that we'll d- discuss when we get. There. <laughs> I know, right? So then Ashley makes Lauren um, sew flowers onto an umbrella, and that Make seems it look to be cute. all she does. Is Make it look wi- cute. Dig the wig out and sew flowers onto an umbrella. Super important jobs. Lauren's like, really? I'm more capable than this. There are other things I can do. So then we head back to the Hillside Villas to Audrina's apartment. This is a low rings. Low point in the episode, Susan. Or a low is point it a of- high point? It could Are you be. kidding me? This is awesome. I love this scene. First of all, Audrina is a badass. She is not yeah, she- playing the reality show game in this scene. Nope. This so- will never happen now. Susan, will you do your Spencer impression when he calls her the first thing he says? Look who it is, my favorite person in the whole world. You didn't you didn't I was gr- smiling. Gr- you, but you have to grin evilly whilst okay. you say it. Look um, who it is, my favorite person in the whole world. I love how she says Heidi and I have some kind of beef. Some kind, aka you. Audrina shuts his skanky little butt down. <laughs> she hangs up on him and then he's startled she's like i'm not playing your stupid games i see what you're doing you have ruined me and heidi's friendship you're trying to create drama and i'm not playing your games spencer pratt i love that and that is why i love audrina i love audrina and she makes no attempt to chase him or try to win him or make up a an I'm with child story, JK, <laughs> no, I'm not story. So she she play, plays this game very differently, and she sees Spencer for what he is from the get-go. Smart. Just a fun, fun time boy. Um, they have other words for that. The kids these days have another word for that, but I'm not going to say we it. We shall on, not use that on... Words on Spoken words on Spoken. the Hills podcast is always PG-13. I did say ass. I hope our mom isn't listening to this anymore. Yeah, I think I said ass too, so... <laughs> So let's go back to Ashley Page's show, which is at Smashbox. 
these fashions, I know that I know that it's dated and I know that it is from another time, but I didn't like anything about it. Usually I can find something to love about something from those days, but um yeah, I, I I was confused though. Was it just bathing suits or was there other outfits too? It was swimsuits okay. and I think there were cover ups and maybe a couple of sundresses and then obviously the infamous umbrella, but it got <laughs> It got me to thinking in general as I was watching what everyone else was wearing because I was really startled by the, the swimsuit fashions. I was just like, this never looked good ever at any point in time. They were so but ugly. Then, but then as I started to look around at what was happening outside of the fashion show, I was like, you know what? I need to discuss this with Susan. This was a really dark time for fashion in general and not just runway fashion, but like street fashion, normal everyday. Like, for example, the designer, Ashley Page, she's wearing jeans with a belt, but it's like the belt. And a ratty t-shirt. Yeah, the belt's like four inches down from the top of the jeans and it almost comes out like a ruffle and then the jeans are like really big and baggy below the belt, but it's really tight and it just, it's atrocious. This never looked good on anyone ever. So Whitney shows up and gets yelled at for not wearing her baby Page shirt and her and Lauren are (laughs) helping all the models and they're everybody screaming backstage it's absolute insanity craziness and Brody calls Lauren right in the middle of the show and for some dumb reason she answers the phone and she's like oh I gotta go sorry my model is here and it was a hilarious brush off she probably answered a strange number thinking it was work related and then remember how Heidi had tried to give her Brody's number she's like so you can screen him when he calls you I'll give you the number and Lauren was like I'm too busy I gotta go I'll get the number later and that led Lauren to not know what his number was, so he could call at any time and throw her off. Okay, got it. You're right. So she probably has to answer the phone right before a fashion show. That happens to me a lot at work. If I'm in the middle of a busy event and I see a strange number, I pick it up, and then it'll be like, this is the Red Cross. We need you to donate blood. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I got to (laughs) go. That happened to me yesterday when I was super busy watching the Gilmore Girls for six hours. And my husband was watching it with me, and he his phone rang. He's like, I got to get this. And I heard him go out in the hall, and he's, I heard him hang up and be like, stupid telemarketers. I'm like, what do you mean you had to get that? <laughs> in the middle of Gilmore Girls, he took four work phone calls. I mean, like, is, is that not a divorceable offense? Yeah, I think that y'all probably need to have some serious talks about this, and you probably need to go to a few couples counseling sessions. I'm sure that they're dealing with a lot of this problem. Susan and I are recording this a couple of days after Thanksgiving, and the day after the Gilmore Girls Netflix special aired. Um, I'm not on the GG train, but Susan I can't and- even talk about this. I don't want to talk about this with you because it stresses me out that my own sister, beloved sister, there are five sisters and every one of us loves Gilmore Girls except you and I can't even talk about it with you. It is too much, too much emotions so this year, for me. This year at Thanksgiving, families had kind of a main dispute. Like, that was the thing that you, like, Don't talk about it, which we did in our family. We did a really good job. Other families, it didn't fare so well. I mean, every family can't be as awesome as ours. But, surprisingly, the second most dramatic subject was (laughs) not skirted over the holidays. And I, I feel like I was really personally attacked by a lot of people in the family for not being excited about the Gilmore Girls. I mean, I personally attacked you, absolutely. Yeah, you, you really did. And you were kind of like cyberbullying me on our <laughs> family text on WhatsApp. Um, Susan even took me off of the family text to have a sidebar about Gilmore Girls. Oh, oh yeah, we totally have a separate text message that you are not on, and it's only the other four, and there have been over 300 messages passed back and forth since we finished watching the Gilmore Girls. But anyway, also- this is not a Gilmore Girls podcast. This is a The Hills podcast. But I would venture to say the Venn diagram has a lot of overlap. So if you, too, love the Gilmore Girls, tweet us your thoughts about the revival because I'm having a hard time finding people to talk about it with me. Tweet your thoughts to Susan and not Jem because Jem will be busy watching sad documentaries about tragedy historical event. So once the fashion show is over, Ashley reveals that she adores Lauren and wants to steal her from Lisa. So all is well and everyone's happy and Ashley is no longer mean to Lauren. So then we head back to the Hillside Villas and Lauren's phone starts ringing on the couch and Heidi answers it. Heidi's dating service! Ha ha ha! And it's Brody. As if you could not make things any more awkward than they already are, Heidi. Like she's taking great delight in this and like, oh, matchmaker ha ha but it's super embarrassing for lauren like she's being too obvious about it. i'm like you've got to play cool hello susan we've done some matchmaking in our time and i feel like we always know how to 
keep it feeling organic, even if it's not. Jim, hold on, Jim. (laughs) Can we talk about what a horrible matchmaker you are, Jim? I'm the worst. You are the worst. You have gotten so many couples together that were so disastrous, bad for each other. Oh, my gosh. But conversely, I give great dating advice. Yes, just don't give, like, you two should be together advice. Heidi passes the phone to Lauren, and it's Brody again. And he doesn't ask her. He tells her he's picking her up and taking her out that night, which annoys me. Hated that. I literally wrote it down where he said, you don't have a show tomorrow. I'm picking you up. And I was like, ooh, I would have been like... Um, how's next Thursday? Because that's my first opening. Look, I'm not into playing games and relationships, but I am definitely think you should do that within the first date, at least. Don't be too available. Yeah, like, even if you are, like, two fabulous, famous, fabulous people, like, be cool and, like, plan it together and, like, show that you're being considerate. And he's just, like, forcing her into this date. I mean, I would have easily gone on a date myself in those days. I wrote in my notes, good thing you're hot, Brody Jenner. You know what I wrote? What? Brody and Spencer smile and talk the same. It just has a different effect. (laughs) They do. I mean, you're right. They talk talk and grin that like, oh my God, Jim, are we discriminating against Spencer because he's not good looking? Yes, we totally are. I don't know. Spencer, I think it acts way worse than him, though. Well, yeah. They might talk the same, but they don't act the same. Spencer is more cold and calculating, which technically makes Brody the dumber one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but Brody also is the son of Bruce Jenner, and Spencer is the son of nobody famous, so he has to be a little thirstier. (laughs) Are you impressed with my use of the word thirsty? Yes, the the youngsters are going to know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I tried to, full disclosure for our fans, I tried to make a joke about Bay earlier and how Heidi might have been the one to coin the phrase, and it bombed so terribly, I told Susan to please cut it out in the final version of the episode. So the next scene, we're back at Teen Vogue in a meeting with Lisa. And Lisa heaps the compliments and praise on Lauren for all the great work she did, and Lauren just sits there smiling and says, oh, Okay, instead of what do we say when someone compliments our work? Thank you. Thank you. And maybe saying, I enjoy what I do, which Lauren did kind of throw something like that out there. Oh, I really like it or something. And then Lisa says, it's obvious that your strength is production. It's really coming out. We need to get you more of that and get you kind of a longer time frame to do that instead of just one day. Um, And so this is kind of a a high point for Lauren from a career perspective. She's having this serious conversation with Lisa, which she still is trying to run away from. (laughs) And then as we move to the next scene at the Hillside Villas, she does punch herself in the face. So <laughs> Lauren's life is very balanced. Absolutely. I mean, work-life balance, am I right? Mm-hmm. Get praise from your boss, be told your future is bright, and then go home and punch yourself in the face by total accident. So that scene at the Hillside Villas is when Lauren is getting ready for a date with Brody. This is the first date Lauren has been on since she and Jason broke up. And she's probably still reeling from the Jason relationship, which was super heavy and real. And I don't blame her for being like, I really don't want to be in a relationship. She probably really didn't. Like, people say that, but I really think she meant it. I just have to say, Brody, there's not a lot of pressure on you, buddy. (laughs) You don't have much to live up to. You just have to be better than Wall, which means go on the date sober, don't chain smoke before you make out with her, and don't buy her street flowers from a from a floral vendor of the LA roads. Come on, Jim. I know you're devastated that there are no vendor flower buying in this episode. Let's I know. I just real. kept hoping it happened, and we never even got close to flowers. It was all about words, the flowery words. There were no flowery flowers. So then we go to Social Hollywood, and Brody looks all nice in his jacket. Brody is so cute. I don't He's like so that. cute. He really is so cute. The thing about I remember my first impressions of him, when I first watched I actually did not know who he was. I didn't know he was Bruce Jenner's son or anything. I just thought he was a cute boy. I didn't didn't know who it was. And all I could think was, oh my gosh, this is literally the first cute boy we've had in the hills. Yeah. Yeah, the very first cute boy. I mean, there were some cute boys in, like, the Laguna Beach years, but they were youngish, and I was a little older, so I never really was like, oh, my gosh, they're so cute, and they were kind of (laughs) shrimpy. He was the first legitimate. Brody is the first, like, man? 
Yeah, he's the first, like, grown-up attractive man yes. to show up in the show or combined with Laguna Beach at all. Um, I mean, I've I've talked before about how Brent Bolthouse would probably be my pick now as an yes. adult, like, so far with the men so far. Right. But if we're talking about people, you know, in their age group, <laughs> um, Brody, and I, and like I mentioned earlier, I was totally falling in love with mm-hmm. him while Lauren was allegedly falling in love with him. And I really, he kind of, you know, he caught my eye from the, that first moment moment when they saw him in the bar oh yeah definitely and then this is his first you know real episode and I just you know fell for him at that moment and now all I think is you know he's just used to saying his charming things and she's so immune to his bs well, and, I mean, let's let's start with what's going on in the restaurant when he's like, I feel so distant from you, and he scoots over, and then he starts complimenting her smile and have the most boring discussion in the world about smiles, and Lauren is really uncomfortable at this point, and yeah. Brody is overdoing it. He's, being, he's laying on way too thick. Which I did not think when I originally no. saw this. I thought it was super cute and sweet. Same. He's just going a little overboard, but also, I want to know who told her she had a creepy smile. I bet it was Jason. Oh, for sure. Sure. They're sort of arguing, flirting, and it is kind of cute, but if we were recording this before we saw the 10th anniversary special, I would have thought it was probably a little cuter than it is. Mm, I don't know. I, I would love to see this scene on edited. I would love to see the raw video from this dinner because yeah. I have a feeling the there was thing. huge silences. It was yeah. super awkward. It just, even with the editing, if there feels like there's an undertone of awkwardness, which, you yeah. know, I mean, a first date is always awkward. Can you imagine being followed by cameras on a first date? But it's not like the normal first date awkward with the two people that might like kind of be crushing on each other. It's like, he's just like pushing it so hard and she's just sitting there like, oh my gosh. I also thought he was a little t- touchy feely for a first date like he kind of he touched her a lot like on her arms and when he like hugged her she seemed like mm. cute like, guys like that dropped, she looked uncomfortable and he kisses her hand and i feel like when they're saying goodbye at the end she barely suppresses an eye roll or a shudder or something like she seems like not into it at all he winced when he gave her that kiss on the cheek she, she went, literally went yeah she did but we're getting ahead of ourselves susan before we finish this recap please note that at one point at the end here brody kissed her hand and she said thank you that to me is like someone saying i love you and responding with thanks absolutely not that there's anything wrong with that because you shouldn't say i love you until you're ready oh heck no but it was just kind of like but no i know what you mean it was it was awkward it was if you really if you if someone really kissed your hand and you thought they were cute and you were on a first date you wouldn't say anything you would just like smile you know simper yeah you would not be like thank you that's yeah, almost that like awkward. get away from me and i bet when i watched it for the first time i thought it was awkward but i thought it was awkward because it was a first date yep and i think it was just awkward because she's not into him but w- let's address that more next week brody it's the first lady in your life who's just not that into you which i kind of love i mean that makes lauren awesome right she's not swayed by all his trappings <laughs> She's not swayed by his lip injections and his four hours of makeup contouring. Oh, oh wait, God. wrong family wrong member. Wrong family member. Does this episode of The Hills pass the Bechdel, Bechdel test? test? Just to give everyone a quick refresher course, since we did leave you hanging for three months wondering if Heidi was pregnant with Spencer's baby, (laughs) the Bechdel test is a series of three questions you can apply to a movie, which is where it originally came from, but in our case, we apply it to every episode of The Hills, because why would we not? Question number one, are there two named female characters in the episode? Oi, matey! No. (laughs) Question number two, do these two named female characters speak to one another? Yes, they do. And we have multiple instances of that in this episode, by the way, which is great. But then that brings us to question number three, which will narrow the pack dramatically. Do the two named female characters speaking to each other talk about anything else besides a man? I mean, they talk about a magic candle. That totally counts. Bechdel test is passed. Woo. Who would have thought that so many episodes of the show so far would have passed this rigorous test? Because By the pretty much skin of their teeth. Every movie that is probably opening for the holidays, I guarantee you none of them passes the test. Guaranteed. But that's probably another not. conversation for another podcast and another time. It'll be the Gem and Susan podcast for social justice that is coming to a, a podcast app near you. No time soon. Winners of the week.
Jem, who is your winner of the week? My winner of the week was so easy, and you touched on it earlier. My winner was Audrina when she hung up on Spencer and didn't play his stupid games. I definitely agree. That was one of my favorite moments of the episode, but I'm going to go with someone else just to be contrary. My winner of the week is Spencer Pratt. <gasps> Did crystals make you say that? <gasps> He is a winner of the week because he is not going to be a father. Jim. And Susan's funniest moments. Jim, what was your funniest moment of this episode? My funniest moment was the whole shindig with the candle wick because you could tell that the designer really made it up just to like give an impossible challenge to Lauren and then she solved it and the lady was just like, oh man, you know, I can't think of anything more ridiculous to tell this girl to do. So that was just really funny to me for that reason. Well, Jim, that was also my funniest moment of the week. You stole it from me. Oh, I'm very upset. It. But I thought the funniest moment of all that funniest moment was that it, there was a witch store across the street. <laughs> Normal. Casual. There are some people in L.A. that are... There are some people in L.A. that are... There are some people in L.A. that are... Jem, my crap falls this week was Spencer being super shady and calling Audrina right after all that mess with Heidi and assuring her that he liked her and he more than liked her, and then he immediately goes and calls Audrina. My prep fall was Spencer pulling up to the back alley, uh, back alley <laughs> of Bolt House, and Heidi hopping in his car and having that entire conversation. It was just cringeworthy any way you look at it, no matter what you want to believe about what was actually happening. That was a massive prep fall, and I hope we don't dip that low again, Susan. I hope we don't. I hope so, too. Well, Jen, it was so nice to podcast with you again. I had so much fun, and I'm so glad that we're finally back. Yeah, we missed everybody. Can't wait to see you on social media, and we'll be back with another brand new episode next week. Thanks for listening to Words on Spoken, the Hills podcast. Here's the scoop on all of the many ways you can contact us. We'd love to hear your feedback and ideas for the show. You can email us at wordsunspokenpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at the Hills podcast and Instagram and Facebook at Words on Spoken podcast. We are even on Tumblr, which definitely did not exist when the Hills first aired. And you can also visit our website, wordsunspokenpodcast.com. Please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. We are also available on Stitcher, Google Play, and SoundCloud. We'll talk to you next Friday. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. You and all your pretty little friends Up in the hills where the party never ends Your schemes and your dreams when you're whole and you're broken I'm telling all about it in my words unspoken Is that all you had to say about that? (laughs) Oh, no, we're getting to that point. (laughs) Already. Can you put your foot down? Stop showing me your foot.